watching the world's longest running talk show, mine, and I'm talking to the greatest audience, you, and I just uh, looked at the back of a book that I'm very eager to launch in a big way. The book is called Are We on the Air? And Joe Franklin, who's an old friend of mine, says, shame on Guy LeBeau. He's told all the secrets of early day television about all the guys and gals of that era, and it's all true. The book is called Are We on the Air? And he is uh, the pioneer, one of the greats of early day TV, and he's written a marvelous book. And guess who's with him? A lady who is, without question, part and parcel of uh, a great American institution. An actress will be talked about forever, Miss Joyce Randolph of the Honeymooners. And uh, between uh, Guy and uh, Joyce, there's going to be one for the archives. Got a couple of my friends who want to chat in a few minutes with uh, these people about the early days of TV. Bob Rennison and Richie Ornstein. And right now, these words as we get ready for a trip down TV memory lane. Stay. I could do 1,000 hours with Guy LeBeau and with Joyce Randolph. Uh, Guy, can I say it's so... Anytime you say, Joe, 1,000, you, you're all right for 1,000 <laughs> hours, aren't you? Great. Sure, <laughs> let's go, Joe. Joyce, how have you been? Fine, thank you. You look so great. How can we not ask you, have you been a fan of uh, Guy LeBeau for a long oh, time? Oh, yes, I've, I've known Guy since, uh, oh, gosh, way back, about 25 years ago at the Lambs Club. Mm -hmm. so we're, we're old friends. Who'd you, know, who'd you know first, Art Carney or uh, Audrey... Uh, Meadows or uh, Guy LeBeau? <laughs> uh, I, I think I knew Guy ahead, ahead of all of them. Really? Yep. Though I, I did meet Audrey ahead of the Honeymooners about uh, two years before that. We did uh, a revival of No No Nanette in Louisville, Kentucky with uh, Gene Barry and Audrey Meadows, um, uh, Hal Leroy, a wonderful cast. Uh, Jack Whiting. Did, did Jackie Gleason come to see the show at that time? No, or? we didn't. No, that, was just, that was ahead of that. So I had worked with Audrey b before the Honeymooners. I got so many things to ask uh, Audrey. Let me to ask uh, Joyce uh, Randolph, I mean Trixie. The guy, <laughs> uh, the publisher is? Spy Publishers. And uh, so, so when do you figure, Guy, that, uh, that uh, sponsors and audiences began to take <clears throat> television seriously? When was the, when it was... Uh, more than a game. Joe, more. I don't want to be cute, but I'm not sure they take it seriously <laughs> even now. <laughs> uh, my guess is that uh, about 1950, when we got out of those commercials, or we began to get out of those commercials that talk about buy now, uh, uh, and uh, in Connecticut, call this number, and in New York City, call the other number. May I tell a quick story you about... Uh, please, uh, yeah, please. Okay. I think uh, one of the most raunchy and outrageous things that happened in the early days of, uh, of television, commercially, was when there was a guy named Joe Rudnick, the head of Sunset Appliance Stores. You mm. probably remember that, Joe. Love it. And uh, he insisted that he wanted to sponsor wrestling, and he was, with me at the microphone. He was making a great deal of money, so he didn't want the show ever to be preempted. But, ah, in 1949, Nature decided to preempt him because they were going to stage a colossal, once in 50 years, uh, eclipse of the moon. Something was supposed to shade the moon, and so WPIX at the time said, well... Joe, we're going to preempt your wrestling show. And Joe said, no, you don't. I got a contract which says, no matter what, catastrophe, volcanoes, whatever, you don't preempt my television show. So they had a big meeting in the sales manager's office, and they decided on this, and this has to be the raunchiest commercial ever. At the very precise moment that the eclipse occurred, yes. remember, once in 50 years, Joe Rudnick signed call Hickory 6, 4,000, for well, the greatest in the electronics was superimposed over the moon. <laughs> I love that. Over the moon. And the next day, uh, Jack Gould, I think his name is Jack in Gould. In the New York Times. In the New York Times. Wrote in the Times and said, this is going to be television of the future. All the station had to do was ask everybody to open up the window. And they could have seen the eclipse. And Joe Rudnick and his commercial, that can't go. People that are listening to that man's voice, of course, you've seen him in a lot of movies, Woody Allen's radio days. But, but people who hear that voice, they're saying... This was a famed sports announcer, and it just hit me just this minute that in your day when you began, or when I began, there were professional sports announcers. Now, mm -hmm. now they're uh, 
former baseball players, the former, Rizzutos, well, former athletes, the, right, the yeah. Ralph Kinder and Correct. the Mercers and the Tom Seavers, and I guess that's, uh, I mean, but in those days it was Mel Allen and, and Guy LeBeau, Honey Desmond, Red, Red Barber, Barber. Right, oh, right. They were great, absolutely great. And of course, kids like myself who learned sort of at their knees were able to have role models, you know right. what I mean? And, sure. Uh, I always wanted to sound like Mel Allen, and the only way I was able to do it by saying my name, this is Gar LeBeau, because he used to call me, hi Gar. It was never Guy. I'm, I'm a fan of Guy LeBeau, not only uh, because of books that he writes, but because he owns a very good, very nice radio station. And Thank I listen, you. I listen to his... You, you do a show on your own station? I heard, yep. you chatting, heard you chatting with Helen Hayes about a week or two ago. That's correct. Every, every day at 2.30, Joe, mm -hmm. WNWK 105.9. Mm -hmm. But I'm an eternal fan of uh, Trixie here, Joyce right. Randolph. <laughs> and it's you know, hard, it's hard know, not to be a great You know what I wonder many nights when I watch that show? Can I ask you a terrible question? How come that uh, neither of those two families ever had a baby? Because they seem such loving, caring, family-like people, and uh, they never had babies. I think Jackie didn't want to bring that into the script at all. Really? I think that was his idea, that there were, there were no babies. Well, he was the boss. But I mean, the other classic sitcoms, like I Love Lucy, they, they, they'd actually show the birth, uh, they'd, the pregnancy... Lucy was having a real baby, you know. So it worked out, right? So, <laughs> yeah. how in hell do you think of things like that? I, I, I would have never. There's sex in there. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so maternal. <laughs> no. Well, when Jackie heard that I was getting married to Dick Charles, uh, we, we were all in Alan Dix one night a after the, doing a show, and as he was leaving, he whispered in my ear, no babies. No kidding. Yeah. What about the differences? <laughs> what, what about the pressures of doing a sitcom, though, Joyce? Let's say then and now. I, I imagine in those days you had to go all the way through. If you made a mistake, you just have to well, maybe well, we, add It was a live show. Yeah, oh, you sure. have to add so a we different punchline. All the way through. We, we never stopped for anything. Any one incident? Any one recollection of one time when uh, uh, things went wrong? Or, uh, uh, <laughs> well, uh, Jackie always said if something went wrong, ad lib in character, and, and that's what you would do. And, and Audrey was very clever. She learned the whole script. She learned everybody's that's words, right, yeah. and she could get it back on track if, if anything bad happened. You had to keep going, right? Mm -hmm, you had to keep going. How could we... Yes, continue. And then there was a, um, a supporting actor on the show, um, George Petrie, who has since done many things out on the coast, a, a slim guy with black hair, and he would try, try to change his looks. But he was on every week playing something because on about the second show when he was on um some little thing did happen and he picked it up real fast and came in with, with some line that covered it and jackie said to, to jack hurdle keep him on the show and he was on bravo joyce one more uh, fairly not not personal but people like uh, to know because they're business minded people are watching joyce randolph now and they're saying uh, she must be riding high on on a bankroll of residuals <laughs> give us give us a little bit on uh, no, really? no. Uh, we weren't too clever about residuals in the old days. Really? Audrey Meadows was. She had a whole phalanx of, of uh, brothers and lawyers and, and managers and agents, and she held out and did get residuals right from the beginning. Uh, Art and I did not. But uh, with the lost episodes, we all have to be paid. After said, you are now taking, Viacom is, is taking these shows, uh, live shows, turning them into half-hour shows on film or tape or whatever, and those people were paid to do them once only. Now you pay all those actors, so we get paid. <clears throat> right, guy, bravo for the union. Bravo, bravo for the for union. Astro, but, yes. but let, me, let me say that even if you have a contract, Joe, there's no guarantee that you're going to get residuals. I was in radio days, as you know, and uh, you told me that I was going to get plenty of residuals, and for the first year you were absolutely correct. But a couple of months ago, I got a check and a letter from Screen Actors Guild. Unbelievable. It said, Guy, cash this check as quickly as possible because Orion Pictures is going bankrupt right. and we can't bounce for the amount of the check. Right. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. And one thing about that yeah. check, it didn't bounce. You want to know why it didn't have the strength? Too weak to bounce. <laughs> no, those, Lovely. Those things happen. You no, know, you hear about these people who make thirty, forty million dollars a movie. I've made a lot of movies, and I get those big residual checks: four dollars, six dollars, yeah. eight dollars, seven dollars. Yeah, indeed, that's how big they are. Heavy, heavy money. It makes you feel so good, though, when you open it up. It says "talent, <laughs> motion picture." <laughs> Miss yeah. Randolph, how can we not ask you? I'm, I'm surrounded here by many, many books that keep coming out on the life and times of Jackie Gleason. I mean, well, you have, they, they have the out, new one there by. No, they come out William all the time. Henry III. All the time. How can we not ask you? And these are all brand new books, right? Yes. yes. How can we not ask you to evaluate the man? I mean, not, not professionally, because we know that talent-wise, oh. he was a giant. But I mean, a I mean, private a genius. But was he was he gracious and kind, or was he was he kind of uh, nasty? Well, as Bill Henry tells in that new book, um, 
he tells it like it is. Uh, right. Jackie was a difficult man to know. Uh, he, he wasn't terribly friendly or terribly outgoing, at, at least not, not with me and, and some of the others. Uh, he had his own group of friends, you know, Toots Shore and, and all his cronies, and uh, he, he stuck with them. He he, wrote he, a, he at wrote 9 o'clock at night, he, Saturday night, he, he took off on his own. He wrote a little rough shot once in a while, right? <laughs> but not nasty, really. No, 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 but, but we ask he, what, he was a strange man. May we ask what keeps you busiest nowadays, Miss Randolph? Oh, well, I have uh, my wonderful life in New York with my husband, and, and we have a 32-year-old son. And uh, my husband is Shepherd of the Lambs Club, which is the oldest theatrical club in America. And we have activities there, and uh, we belong to the players. And, and I and, saw uh, you one time at a nostalgia convention. They oh, were yes. There were four or five stars. And the other four, I got to tell, you know, not to make you feel good, the other four were kind of lonely and at Joyce Randolph's table lined up all around the block. I mean, the, the popularity <laughs> oh, no. of, 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 the, of the Gleason well, of era. The, yeah, of the Gleason era, of the honeymooners, yes. I'm so proud to be part of it. So, mm. As a matter of fact, it's on twice a day now, isn't it? Is all it, of them. Uh, all of them. Yeah, well, you can laugh in the morning and well, laugh every saying, night at 1130. But, yeah. Guy, when you say twice a day, it's on probably 5,000 5, no, times. I'm talking about so here in New York. But, you know, all over. What, what, uh... What's one of your favorite anecdotes? Then I got a little surprise for you. Well, one of my favorite anecdotes uh, originated right here with Channel 9, W O R, uh, in 1947 or 48. That's, when it, was, that's when it was one W. Now it's two W's. I know. Right. But uh, if if a station wanted to go on the air, they had to look for a, a place where they could have cameras and audience and things like that. And there were none around unless you went to an abandoned church or, in the case of W O R at the time, Channel 9, an old stable. And did it? stink quite quite <laughs> actually uh then they went wor went to uh, the empire state building i don't know whether you were with wor at the time they had a small thing that looked like a one-room studio apartment right and if you were an announcer and i was at the time wanted to do a station break or a little cut in or a little off-camera commercial you had to sit on a toilet bowl <laughs> in a toilet <laughs> And I said, uh, the guy said to me, the AD, the first time he said, Guy, I want you to go to the toilet. And I said, I don't have to go. Right. And he said, uh, well, no, <laughs> if you don't go to the toilet, they'll flush you out of it. A whole series of, you know, cliches. Of you could have been the first Howard Stern. Ah, that's true. I, <laughs> right. Why didn't I think of that? You could have fallen a little bit behind in your work. No, I want to listen. <laughs> what, I, what I want to do is bring in a couple of people who want to chat with Guy LeBeau, uh, schmoozing about the early days of TV. And I'm very honored to be featured in this book about the time that I was selling the, the unbreakable dishes, and guess what happened? <laughs> they broke on the floor. We'll be right back with Guy LeBeau and with uh, Joyce Randolph, with two people who want to chat with them and appear on Guy LeBeau's radio show. Be right back. Stay here. I am chatting here with the uh, famed pioneer, where do you start? Newscaster, sportscaster, talk show host, variety show MC, whatever you want to uh, name, he created that category. His name was Guy LeBeau. And uh, <clears throat> the introduction by Ed McMahon, was, is that an old pal from those days too? A very old pal, yes. Uh, while I was uh, working at WPIX, he was... Listen, I have to mention that station. Uh, Anything you want. <laughs> anyway. He was working in WCAU television. Mm -hmm. And he was doing the same kind of thing that I was. He had to make quick changes to go from sports to news and stuff like that. An icon in the television business was uh, Joe Bolton. Everybody remembers him as the original top name weatherman, if you recall. And I remember Joe once doing the, daily, uh, once doing the news break at 6 o'clock, uh, wearing nothing but uh, a shirt, tie, and uh, BBDs. Because our changes had to be so quick. Joe, may I tell a very important story? He, he was known as Officer Joe. Officer Joe. But he was also a weatherman. May I tell a, an interesting story about Channel 9? And uh, it always reminds me of the great power of television. Right. Uh, there was a, a, a fine actor and Olympic star by the name of Buster Crab. Larry and, Buster Crab. Larry Buster Crab. And he replaced... Um, uh, Weissmuller in the Tarzan series. Right. But all of that was going nowhere. The, the whole importance of Tarzan was dwindling down. So he came to New York and tried his fortune in about 1946-47. He was busted. And he got a job to do some Olympic uh, lessons or something of that kind, swimming lessons in uh, England. 
while that was going on, Channel 9, this very self-same channel, decided that they wanted to go out, get on television, get some exciting films, and they bought some Tarzan films from somewhere starring Buster Crabbe. In the six months that he was away in England, mm -hmm. thinking he was busted and out of fame, right. he became very famous right here in New York City and elsewhere as a result of those Tarzan pictures. When he returned, because Channel 9 said, come back, we've got something for you. When he returned, he was greeted at the airport or at the train, wherever he was, by crowds that he thought had gathered for some catastrophe. <laughs> they had gathered for <laughs> autographs for bus from Buster Crabbe. And that's how quickly somebody could become a star hmm. in the early days. One time I had, I had Ed Wynn on my show. Remember Ed Wynn? And I he certainly did. And, and he was doing his jokes, and he didn't... He wondered why all the cameramen were laughing. You know why they were laughing? Because there was a cat walking behind him. <laughs> and you know, what, you know what Ed Wynn said? He said, I'm... He turned around and he said, listen, pussy, I'm doing, I'm, doing a, I'm doing a monologue, not a catalogue. I'm doing a monologue, not a catalogue. <laughs> hey, good. You've got to put that in your next book. I, I've got great memories. Too. Very good. And I'm chatting here with Joyce Randolph and... Uh, you know, George, the reason I asked you about the, the, why he didn't want to put babies in the show, because in one, in one episode, I remember Jackie Gleason came home with a baby that he found on the bus. Yes. Mm. So why would he be anti-babies? Well, <laughs> he wasn't anti, but we just had that one script that was that way, and, and the next week there was no baby there, you know. <laughs> Listen, I've got a friend of mine, Guy Lebeau, a very close friend of mine, and uh, he was on our show recently, and when I told him that you'd be here, his name is Bob Renison, and Bob is the author of uh, How to Be Treated Like a High Roller, even though you're not one. And I was riding in a car one time with Bob listening to your radio show, and Bob said to me he's got one big ambition, and that is to go on your show and talk about this book. So say hello to <coughs> Mr. Renison, Mr. LeBeau. How are you? Nice nice pleasure. Pleasure. you All I give... need is a tip, and you can come on forever. <laughs> you want to give a good a... tip, and you can get the stage. You want to give a little resume, a little thumb, thumb nose description of what happens in the book? Actually, I, I run a casino in Atlantic City, the Claridge. Uh -huh. uh, and you know, this is probably one of the few books that's been written that doesn't talk about how to win but how to get a comp or how to open a credit line or what goes on behind the scenes, all, all the questions that people ask every day. So. I understand you're very good to people who get VIP cards like my son. He always tells me he's broke, he's a lawyer, but he's always out getting um, you know, fancy sweets and uh, free meals. How does he do all that? It really depends. Uh, the, each place has, uh, has a different way of doing it, but uh, by and large, in the end, there's nothing free. It, you, know, you don't get something for nothing. It's kind of make-believe that you're getting something for nothing, right? It's kind of an optical illusion, right? Well, a lot of people come and play, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. If you're going to take that chance and you can get something into the bargain, why not do it? It, it makes the whole thing more fun and exciting, and that's yeah. supposedly what, it, what it's all about down there. But there is a way to enjoy a casino visit. Give us one little tidbit on how to, how to really enjoy that. Uh... I think the, uh, the best way is to come with the, with the right idea in mind, and that's to have a good time. Yeah, some days you might win, some days you might lose. You know, but you know the place that you go to uh, should be a place that that you enjoy being at, not some place where you're you're subjecting yourself to a, you know, a terrible experience. So give us one visit. one line, one little tip on how to be treated like a high roller. Give us one tidbit on that. Pick one place and and be a frequent customer there, rather than spreading yeah. your action yeah. around. Yeah. Because the more one place gets to know you, the more likely they are to recognize you and to treat you better. Mm -hmm. Well. Uh, I hope that Mr. Uh, Renison uh, sells a lot of books and gets on the Guy Lebeau. Has he got, oh, okay, oh, you, got, you think he might be booked for the Guy Lebeau? I don't have my schedule with me, <laughs> but count on it. Now, we've got on our panel uh, each and every day a resident triviologist, my right I, hand, left hand man. I Richie, see him often. Yeah. Richie Ornstein. Yeah. Richie, what do you want to ask or say about uh, either uh, gambling or the golden age of TV and Joyce and Guy? Gambling, I'm going to follow Bob anywhere he goes. And as far as Guy goes, he's been my hero ever since I can remember. Oh, all right. And Joyce, I watch you every single night. And I'd like to know, how could a show like that, there's been thousands and thousands of shows over the years, sitcoms, your show didn't have that many episodes, but yet we could watch the show over again and enjoy it every day. And uh, what was the secret? What was the ingredients that went into it that made it happen 40 years later or approximately? Mr. Gleason's answer always was, it was funny. And that that's, was his answer. It was funny. But we had wonderful writers. <clears throat> don't, don't you think we had wonderful writers? We had a whole phalanx of them, but they were great. And uh, the two men were magic together. Just and Jewish, two you, Irishmen. Just, you, know you, know what story, you know what scene is coming up? You know the dialogue. You know what the twist is going to be. The linchpin. And you sit there anyway, waiting for it, and you laugh like hell. You're absolutely right. Yeah. You know, Danny Thomas used to talk about that that he could do the same joke over and over and over again. I doubt that he ever changed his routine. Mm. He just was funny at whatever he did. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we're only we're only tickling the appetite. We can just scratch the surface and tell you that this is uh, this is a real book in real stores, right? Sure it is. Published by published by Carroll Publishing under their Lyle Stewart label. Oh, I know Lyle Stewart. I wrote a famous book for him once called Classics of the Silent Screen. Famous, very big. So you know that book, right? Yes, right? yes. Goes yes. on forever. And uh, the publisher of uh, Guy LeBeau's book, one more time, is Spy Publishing. Can I ask you a terrible question? Do you cover some of the illicit or fixed game shows of that era? I even tell stories about myself. And really? I, I'm terribly ashamed, fellas. I shouldn't be sitting with this august group. Well, what the hell? <laughs> really? You, yeah. you, do, you do talk about some of the... I certainly do. You, you blow the whistle a little bit? I blow the whistle. <laughs> we shall return following these words with Guy LeBeau, Joyce Randolph, Bob Renison, Richie Ornstein, and you. Stay here, please. Guy LeBeau says he wants to touch of Richie Ornstein and stump the panel. Yell it out, panel. Jump in. Hollow Wilcox was the announcer for what radio show? Can't remember that. Fibber I... McGee and Molly. That's uh, right, Joe. That's easy. That's Does he have these fixed? I, I... No way. No this fixed. man is a genius. I always tell him that. <laughs> In 1944, who won the Best Supporting Actor Oscar for the movie Going My Way? Barry Fitzgerald. That's right. Very oh, good. Joe, put it right there. Not fiction. <laughs> he knows this stuff. In 1955 movie, The King and I, whose frequent refrain was et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, of course. You're, you're uh, Brenner. Brenner, yeah, Joyce, yeah. you have it. Clark Gable, Jack Oakey, and Loretta Young starred in which 1935 movie about a Yukon adventure? Written by Jack London called... Call, Call of the, of the Wild. 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 It's been a wild show. Yeah. I recommend some good books. I recommend you listen to Guy LeBeau on the radio. Look for Are We on the Air. Look for How to Be Treated Like a High Roller. I'll treat you to more good shows starting with tomorrow night. Meanwhile, have a good everything and uh, happy reminiscing. <laughs>